Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start by answering the question that I know is on everyone's mind because I've been asked it about seven times. It's a one piece. I'm wearing a onesie. <laughs> Those of you that I don't know, uh, my name is Liz Oyer, and I'm the pardon attorney. I think I know at least half the people in this room, which is really awesome. It's great to see so many friendly faces. I am so appreciative that so many of you have come out this morning for this really important event. We're going to have an important conversation today about second chances. The Office of the Pardon Attorney works to support second chances through clemency for the many Americans who have been through the criminal legal system. Our work is grounded in the principle that each of us is capable of redemption and each of us is deserving of the opportunity to achieve it. To assist our fellow citizens who are seeking second chances, it is essential that we understand the challenges that they face along that path. So in that spirit of understanding, we have a wonderful group of speakers here today who will share their personal and professional experiences with the criminal justice system. I am incredibly grateful to this group of people for opening this window for us. Our discussion will focus on collateral consequences. Criminal convictions often have collateral consequences that long outlast the actual sentence that is imposed. Collateral consequences take many forms, including diminished employment opportunities, barriers to housing, loss of civil rights, and disruption of family relationships. Collateral consequences cut to the core of our most basic needs as humans. They can create almost permanent obstacles to success and stability in the community. These obstacles disproportionately burden people of color, but they affect all of us because they make our communities less safe and less prosperous. With the help of our panelists, we will discuss solutions. We'll talk about the role that clemency and other tools can play in easing the lifelong burden of a criminal record. Together, we can make our communities safer and stronger with no one left behind. Before we turn to our panel, we have some remarks from the Associate Attorney General, Vinita Gupta. As many of you know, Associate Attorney General Gupta has dedicated her career to protecting our civil rights. She has worked to ensure that the criminal legal system operates with fairness, integrity, and compassion. She is a leader in upholding the ideal of equal justice and an ally in supporting second chances. Unfortunately, Associate Attorney General Gupta was called away this morning and cannot be with us in person, but she did not want to miss the opportunity to address this group, so we will hear from her by video. Good morning. I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person in the Great Hall today, but I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to participate in this incredible event. I want to thank the Office of the Pardon Attorney and the Pardon Attorney herself, Liz Oyer, for inviting me to be a part of this. Clemency is a powerful tool. My first case in my first job out of law school resulted in the then Texas governor granting 35 pardons in 2003 to my clients, men and women who were wrongfully convicted in a small town called Tulia. To say those pardons changed their lives would not even begin to describe it. But I also was all too aware of how challenging it was for each person to navigate reintegrating back into their communities. I carried their stories with me many years later when I worked with the Office of the Pardon Attorney in 2014 before I joined the Justice Department the first time through the Obama Administration's Clemency Initiative. I want to recognize and thank Liz and her entire office for the important work they are doing, not just on pardons and the clemency process, but also in bringing awareness to issues like collateral consequences and the ways in which criminal conviction or incarceration can follow a person, sometimes for the rest of their lives. This conversation is an important one. I'm proud to be part of a Justice Department that prioritizes engaging with and hearing from people who have experienced the justice system firsthand, either themselves or through loved ones. The perspectives of justice impacted people are important for us to lift up at events like this and for us to listen to as we consider and evaluate policies and programs. Thank you to our panelists for sharing not only your stories, but your insights and recommendations. 
The thing is, justice impacted individuals, those who have been arrested, incarcerated, or come into contact with the justice system, are not a small group. In America today, as many as one in three people have a criminal record, an estimated 70 to 100 million people nationwide. By some estimates, a similar percentage of American children, one in three, have had at least one parent with a criminal record. And in 2020, almost 550,000 people returned to the community from state and federal prisons, while millions more cycled through local jails. Every one of those people is affected by collateral consequences. They might be excluded from certain jobs because of a criminal record, or unable to keep their family under one roof because of a family member's past conviction or unable to obtain necessary medications upon release from prison or jail, exacerbating existing health challenges and deepening cycles of poverty. Collateral consequences present huge challenges precisely because they affect the essential parts of our daily lives, housing, employment, food, health care, and more. And they have long-lasting multi-generational impacts. A parent misses prime wage earning years to incarceration and then struggles to get a job after returning home, making it difficult to provide for their family and increasing the likelihood their children grow up in entrenched poverty. The effects go beyond directly impacted individuals and their immediate families. These losses multiply within some communities with disproportionate impacts on communities of color. The Brennan Center estimates 372.3 billion that's with a B, in lost earning annually from those impacted by a criminal conviction or past imprisonment. And when an employer doesn't hire someone based solely on their past, we all lose out on the insights, perspectives, and talents that person may bite drink to the job, and we also lose the chance to get to know and work with them as a colleague. The Justice Department believes in second chances. We believe in supporting reentry and easing unnecessary barriers. We are committed to working with our federal agency partners because reentry is not just a criminal justice system issue. Last year, in the very room you are sitting in, the Office for Access to Justice, with the support of my office, put on a reentry simulation for a group of federal employees from agencies across the government. The goal of the simulation is to help those who have never experienced collateral consequences get a real glimpse of what those first days and weeks home are like. Participants are assigned an identity and a long list of tasks to complete, but they are hobbled by transportation issues and court dates, difficulties compiling necessary paperwork, and more. It was eye-opening, to say the least. We have carried forward that spirit of cross-government collaboration. The executive order on advancing effective, accountable policing and criminal justice practices to enhance public trust and public safety established the Federal Interagency Alternatives and Reentry Committee with three goals. One, safely reducing unnecessary criminal justice interactions. Two, supporting rehabilitation during incarceration. And three, facilitating reentry into society of people with criminal records. As part of our interagency work, this past spring, the Justice Department released a strategic plan, Rehabilitation, Reentry, and Reaffirming Trust, in which we lay out our current work and our plans in these three areas. I want to highlight a few aspects of that plan today. One of the things I'm proudest of is our ongoing work around fines and fees. In April, I announced an updated Dear Colleague letter aimed at helping state and local courts and judges guard against unlawful fines and fees practices. We outlined relevant case law around fees for both adults and juveniles and cautioned against racially discriminatory enforcement of fines and fees. We also emphasize that in many cases, unaffordable fines and fees may undermine public safety, instead impeding successful reentry, increasing recidivism, and weakening community trust in government. Many leaders at all levels of government have taken steps to address those unintended consequences. After we published our letter this spring, I asked our Office for Access to Justice to prepare a best practices guide which we expect to be published in the coming weeks, building on the recommendations in the letter and shining a spotlight on innovative work by states, municipalities, juvenile justice agencies, and court leaders around the country. On the healthcare front, we know what a lifeline Medicaid can be and how critical it is to have continuity of care, including when leaving incarceration. We're working with our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services to raise awareness and support states through both grants and technical assistance in implementing the Medicaid 
1115 reentry demonstration waiver, a new opportunity for states to improve care transitions for certain individuals nearing release from incarceration. We're also funding other efforts at the state and local level. Last year, we awarded nearly $100 million in grants to support successful reentry and reduce recidivism, including funding to improve correctional education and employment programs, both during incarceration and after, and to address treatment and recovery needs of individuals with mental health, substance use, or co-occurring disorders. We will be announcing FY23 awards soon and expect to continue to support efforts to address challenges faced by individuals currently or previously involved in the criminal justice system. In addition to supporting our state and local partners, we are looking at what we can do inside the department. The Pardon Office, for example, is working with the Office for Access to Justice to make the clemency process more accessible by simplifying and streamlining the pardon application form. Doing so will help applicants in the process and we hope encourage more people to apply for pardons. We are also addressing barriers to securing government-issued identification upon release from the Bureau of Prisons. An ID is so often a prerequisite to housing, employment, and other essentials. BOP is developing a release identification card that individuals can use to obtain a state-issued ID and is consulting with the Department of Homeland Security to develop a release folder containing official documents necessary to obtain real ID compliant identification. And finally, I wanna give a shout out to the Office of Justice Programs and its two second chance fellows, Angel Sanchez and John Bay. Through the fellows program, OJP brings in formerly incarcerated individuals with significant reentry policy and practice expertise. Both Angel and John have made significant contributions during their time with us, with Angel working on Pell Grant reinstatement with the Department of Education and John working with the Department of Housing and Urban Development to review their policies with an eye towards ensuring that they are not unduly harsh for individuals with criminal records. We look forward to welcoming two new fellows in the coming year. I will close by thanking all of you for coming to the Justice Department today for this conversation. Your work and presence inspire us to do more to support second chances and build healthy and safe communities. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the Associate Attorney General for those thoughtful remarks. I'd like to now invite our panelists to join me on stage. I will introduce them to you once they are seated, but please join me in welcoming them to the Department of Justice. Everybody remembered their seats, thank you. <laughs> uh, I wanna introduce our panelists, starting with Sheena Mead. Sheena is CEO of the Clean Slate Initiative, a national bipartisan coalition that advances policies to expand and automate the clearing of criminal records. Previously, Sheena helped to found the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition and to lead the statewide campaign to restore voting rights to citizens with felony convictions. Sheena has used her own experience with the criminal legal system as a catalyst for a career dedicated to ending disenfranchisement and discrimination against people with criminal records. Tony. Tony Lewis Jr. is an author, community leader, reentry expert, and champion for children with incarcerated parents. Tony's father was sentenced to life in prison when he was nine years old. Tony has spent most of his life advocating for his dad's release. Just this year, his efforts were successful and his father came home after 32 years. He's also with us today in this room. Tony has also successfully advocated to expand voting rights for incarcerated DC residents, to improve employment and housing for returning citizens, and to enhance gun violence intervention programming, among many other things. Amy Ralston Pova is a two-time clemency recipient and an accomplished clemency advocate. 
In 1992, Amy was sentenced to 24 years in prison for her role in a drug conspiracy. In 2000, her sentence was commuted by President Clinton, and in 2021, she received a pardon from President Trump. Following her release from prison, Amy started the Can Do Foundation, a nonprofit that educates the public about the effects of mass incarceration and serves as a resource for those seeking clemency. Robert Richardson is an author, activist, and clemency recipient. In 1997, he was sentenced to 61 years imprisonment as a first-time offender in the state of Louisiana. Thanks to his wife's advocacy, Rob was granted clemency by the governor in 2018. Since his release, Rob has been an advocate for families like his own that have been affected by incarceration. The Richardson family shared their story in the award-winning documentary film, Time, which was released in 2020 and in a book by the same name. And finally, Ames Crowart is senior counsel and John L. New justice counsel for the Brennan Center for Justice, an independent nonpartisan law and policy organization that works to improve America's justice system and democracy. He leads quantitative and policy research focused on trends in crime and the collateral consequences of mass incarceration. Ames also advocates for reforms to the criminal legal system at the state and federal levels. Please join me in welcoming Ames and all of our other wonderful panelists. All right, thanks everybody. Can you hear me okay? okay. I wanna start by asking each of you to help us to understand the problem of collateral consequences. Most of you have experienced collateral consequences firsthand, and those of us who have not can learn a lot from your experience, so I'm really grateful for your willingness to share. I'm gonna start with you, Sheena. I wanna ask you about a very personal experience. When you were a young woman, your life was upended when you were arrested in your home. Would you take us back to that day and describe that experience for us? Yes. Well, first, I want to just, uh, Liz, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the Department of Justice inviting me today. Um, and also, thank you for being intentional by bringing directly impacted people with different lived experiences to be on the panel um, so we could talk about us and nobody has to talk for us. So I appreciate that. Um, before I could get to that day that I got arrested, I, I have to give some context a little bit before that. It, it was 2004. I was then a young single mother of four. Um, essentially living in poverty, could not, um, you know, work, living paycheck to paycheck. I was on government assistance. Um, I was grateful for the support I got from the government at that time, being on Section 8 and trying to raise my children. It was right after both hurricanes. I don't know if y'all remember when, like, Florida got hit with two hurricanes, literally back to back within 30 days. I was in Port St. Lucie, St. Lucie County, so I was, like, right at the eye of the storm. So, I, you know, I was displaced, trying to build, build my life back. Um, and I went to the grocery stores to get some food for my children. And also, you know, back in the day, we used to write checks a little bit over the amount to get cash back. Anybody remember those times? Okay, I'm not the only one. And I also was a person that was trying to operate off of faith, and I had financial, uh, a lack of financial literacy because I wrote the check maybe, it was a Wednesday, I went to go get groceries, and I'm like, you know, hopefully the check don't clear until Friday till my direct deposit come. Well, I had went um, and got some groceries, wrote the check over so I could have gas to get my children to daycare. And essentially, I, I realized that the check might have got, had bounced. And then the check had got returned. I had wrote that check for $87.26. Now, somewhere in between there, as I should be accountable that I didn't pay the check um, at that time, but about two months later, I had a knock at my door. It was the afternoon when my children came home from school and had two cops at my door um, to arrest me on a warrant for a returned check, a worthless check. Now, should I have gone to jail for $87.26? No. Um, I had wrote this check to a large corporation who makes billions, and the, the prosecutor had discretion not to uh, arrest me, but I got arrested that day, and that day I got locked up in front of my four children. It was my first time, my first touch was the, um, the system. 
So you have said that that was really just the beginning for you of your journey with the criminal justice system and the, the punishment that you would face. Can you talk about what you mean by that and, and how that affected you afterwards? Yes. So first of all, I was already scared to call my mom because my mom always told me, if you ever get arrested, don't call me. <laughs> so I was like, oh crap, I got to call her to get me out. And so um, I went to jail and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to pay these people their money. Plus, I had to pay back extra fees for getting locked up, and then I had to take off time from work to go to, like, the court. And so I'm thinking, this thing is, this is behind me, just moving forward. And I thought it was just the past. But it wasn't until it was time for me to just do the things that we do as parents, like go to the, go to a field trip with my child and have to fill out a form and then get nervous about being stigmatized or stigmatizing my child because it's a box that says, have you been arrested? And if you have, what did you do? So it, it created barriers for me with my engagement with my children um, for some of the activities I wanted to do. Uh, it even uh, created barriers to going to higher education. I finally, you know, a few years later, um, I decided to go back to college to further my education because of the issue of having, you know, a record and can't get certain type of jobs. And even then, I had to get met with that box again with the question. And I was like, you know what, let me just check this box. But then it, it was another thing I had to do. I had to go get my depositions. I had to go take off time from work to go drive back to that county. And so it just kept hitting me in the face. And I thought that it was over, but my sentence had truly had been getting then. And then even face issues with housing. So you mentioned uh, feelings of, of stigma around that. What, what do you mean by that? Can you describe what that feels like? Well, I know we could all talk about what it feels like. Um, I could tell you, I could give you a perfect example. Um, you know, and I, I will share somebody else's experience also. My husband's in the audience, Desmond. We were, I'm gonna fast forward to probably not even five years ago, we went to go look for a home, to go rent a home. We finally had financial stability. We was like, you know, we could afford to live where we want to live. We just, men and four passed, life was good. We thought we could go move into a place. And I remember seeing, you know, my husband had shared his story out loud a lot before I was sharing my story about formerly incarcerated, what he's going through. But I saw the shame that came up to him when he was nervous about filling out this application for us to go get a rental home um, because of the stigma that may carry with that. And actually, our worst fears became true. We started to get denied application after application. We would go see the home. Our children had packed up the home. They're excited. Our kids had boxed up everything to the pots and pans. I was like, wait a minute, we can't eat this way. I gotta not pack up everything. And we were going looking for a home and we were getting rejected and we could not figure out why we were getting rejected. And then it came to us, it's our records that's popping up in the system. Even though the application says, if it's been longer than seven years, don't worry about it. And it was longer than seven years. But because of technology, it will pop up. And we were getting rejected. And I finally just said to the agent on the next home, I said, actually, I don't want you to try to like broker this house for me. I wrote a letter. I literally wrote a two-page letter explaining who I was, who my husband was, our accolades. I even had the input in there about a little white dog, the hope that it gives us a better chance to get in a home. And that's the stigma that you have, you know, that I carry. Um, about rejection, about just my past continually coming to our face. Thank you for, for sharing that, Sheena. Um, I know that you work as an advocate with a lot of people who've experienced similar types of consequences, and one big area is professional licensing. Can you talk a little bit about some of the barriers in that area that, that folks that you have worked with face? Yeah, so I will tell you, so prior to me having that conviction, back in, um, I think, 2001, I had my first day job at a, a maximum security prison. I was in classification. I was like a sentencing specialist, had an admin job. And that was my first, like, inside, um, being able to have, like, visibility of what happens on the inside of, of a prison. And I saw folks getting trades, right? Excited about taking up trades with barbering, cosmetology. And they would try to bring that home to transfer those skills back home. But what I realized is that in a lot of states, there are restrictions about just getting a simple license to do barbering, cosmetology, even washing hair. I was in Oklahoma last year, and I met a group of women who came out and started their own advocacy group to help women get back into, into the workforce. 
And the lady um, talked about how they had to push for legislation just to get people who wash hair, not using chemicals, <coughs> not using anything but shampoo and water, things that we do every day, to be able to get a license to wash hair. And women were like, shut out the system and men. And so occupational license, whether it's driving for trucks, whether it's barbering, um, I mean, it, it's like 44,000 different occupation licenses, certifications that people are locked out of getting across the country. I'm going to come back to you, Sheena, but I'm going to ask Tony a couple uh, a couple of questions. Tony, oh. you're going to have to share the mic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, we've only got we've only got three. I appreciate it. <laughs> Tony, like Sheena, you had a life changing experience with arrest, but in your case, it was your father's arrest. You were nine years old when your dad was arrested. Can you talk to us about how that changed your life, and especially how it changed your relationship with your father when he went to prison? Yeah. Um, so 34 years ago, uh, April 15th, 1989, uh, my father was arrested. Um, and when that happened, it was a, first of all, it was like, you know, everywhere as it relates to like the news uh, and the newspaper. And uh, it was a big deal here in the District of Columbia. Um, and before that, my memories were like everybody in our family always smiling, honestly, right? Um, and I'm the only child. Uh, my mom, my dad, my, all of our, my grandmothers, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, everybody, right? Life was good. Um, and when he went away, that like changed instantaneously. Um, and, you know, when they were in court, uh, you know, every day when I come home from school, it was on the news and bulletproof courtrooms. And um, then they had got moved to Quantico Marine Base. So it wasn't even at DC jail anymore. You had to visit at the cell, uh, which was for a kid that was, um, you know, real traumatic. Um, and my mother, uh, she changed when he went away. Um, she started really to uh, battle deep mental illness. And um, so I kind of lost both my parents in the way that I had them prior. Um, subsequently, my dad would get shipped to Lompoc, California for the next 13 years. Um, and in that period, um, we, we saw each other probably 48 hours. Um, I, went, I went out there in 92, 96, and in 99. And I'm growing up in, in the District of Columbia at a time where it was its most violent. And my neighborhood was in the bullseye of that. Um, my dad was a very doting, hands-on father prior to his incarceration, um, which uh, fortified a relationship that uh, we had to fertilize and cultivate through letters, through calls. Um, luckily, my maternal grandmother, who took me in, really, um, you know, my dad wasn't the first person in our family to go to prison. Um, our neighborhood was filled with that. That was actually what men did in my community. And so um, I say that to say it was a strategy on how to do time with people. And I was raised in that culture. And so that allowed me to, um, you know, hold on to my father and, again, um, to let him parent from prison um, as much as possible, um, all while trying to shoulder what was happening, you know, with my mother and um, her going back and forth to our mental health hospital at different points, um, me going to one of the most prestigious high schools in the city, my friends dying, um, my friends going to jail, uh, so my life um, took an incredible turn when my father went to prison. And then economically, like everything changed, everything. Um, it wasn't anything that was the same, um, except for, I think, you know, our love for each other, you know? Um, and every time I got on the phone, him, <laughs> I could hear the, the, the worry in his voice about, um, you know, me being out here. And, and in me, you know, my innocence was stripped when he went to prison. I had to really grow up, like, really fast. Um, and in my mind, I remember my dad got life without parole. Uh, and at the time, obviously, I didn't know what that meant, right? But I remember him telling me that I had to be strong. And in my mind, what that meant was um, there was no instructions outside of that. But for me, as, a, as by that time, I'm like, yeah, nine, nine, 10 years old, I'm like, that means I have to, um, you know, remain steadfast no matter what happens. And a lot happened in that 34 years. A tremendous amount of pain and trauma, um, not to mention my, his, you know, my 
my paternal grandmother, his mom, passing away. His brother, his little brother being murdered. His sister dying, nephews dying, other friends. You know, me having to be the messenger in those moments um, and trying to console and comfort him as much as I could on the other end of the phone, but also, you know, me to and him comforting me because, you know, I had to deal with those losses also. So um, I am incredibly grateful for us to have, um, you know, being able to survive uh, that. And, you know, every day for somebody that has life without parole is like the same day as far as you're not chipping away at your sentence. And I went, every, like I said, everybody else was around me was incarcerated and I did time with them as well. I've been all around this country to federal prisons, but it was always different with my dad than them because, you know, each day was a day closer to them coming home. And so uh, he was adamant about that prison was like the worst place in the world. And you, you know, he would never want to see me there. Um, and, and, you know, I'm grateful for him in that capacity. And that's why I've never stopped fighting for his freedom. Um, and, and other people's, but particularly his. And our relationship in that first nine years um, allowed us to be able to survive, you know, the 34 years that he was incarcerated. And on uh, March 20th of this year, he was released. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, important too to just acknowledge um, Brittany K. Barnett, who was my father's attorney. Um, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, she, her, her legal prowess, her, her um, you know, everybody here, I think, understands how amazing she is. But at the end of the day, uh, what that did was uh, she helped us reunite, right, and, and, and freedom. I think uh, when people are released from incarceration, sometimes people lose sense of, um, you know, what, what that, that process was like. And for children, um, you know, that's why having an incarcerated parent could be one of the most traumatic experiences for a kid. Even sometimes more traumatic than even losing a parent to death because, it's, you know, until you're reunited, that trauma just continues. And I'm just, you know, really happy that it's, that's over for me. Now, you said that you were able to travel to see your dad three times when you were a, a yeah, teenager. Point, he, was while, well, he was in California. Correct. Yeah, and that's probably a big expense and trip for your family. Can you just talk to us? What was it like to even be able to to do that, to make that, that trip? Yeah, that, that's a great question. First of all, I can say for sure, most kids from a community like mine would never go to Lompoc, California to visit somebody in prison. They would, just it, never they would get not to be able them. to afford yeah. to do that, right? Um, and particularly like here in DC where all of, uh, whether you break a local law or federal law, people go into the BOP, right? And so most people just aren't going on visits. You could be as close as, you know, Pennsylvania or Kentucky and for poor families, it's expensive. Some, most people don't have cars, right? And then so to rent a car or to pay for a ride, you got gas money. If you're going too far, you, you're, you're gonna have to spend the night, right? Um, you, you go on these visits, you go to these places, and sometimes you may have on the wrong clothes. Uh, I've been through it all. My grandmother was, one time we went, we had my uncle who was in Allenwood. We, we took a trip up, up there. She, she was in her 70s at this point. She had knee replacements, and they kept setting off the metal detector, and she couldn't get in. One time, my uncle took his cancer medicine, and they do a, a drug detector going in to visit in. I mean, so you, you're wasting money. This is why I'm bringing that up, because you go all, you travel all that way, and then people can't even get in. Or you get to the facility, and the fog is too, too heavy. But for a poor family, that's catastrophic, because you're putting all your money into these trips. So traveling to California was like not even an option. I was super um, happy, obviously, in 92, when I went, I hadn't seen my dad since he left the area, which at that point was like two or three years. Then again, I didn't see him for, until four years after that, and then three years after that. Um, and I, we were grateful for that, but that's just, if you think about that, you're spending maybe six hours on a visit. So like I said, in 13 years, we spent maybe 48 hours together. Um, and so most kids in my position would not see their parent, and that really erodes that familiar bond. It's no way, it's hard to do it even when you are visiting. Um, that's, it's one of the most unnatural existences possible, right? And you're trying to have the most personal conversations in here, right, with strangers, right? And you're, rather it's arguments, you think about this too. Um, 
when, when kids are growing up, right? When he left, I was nine. When I come see him the next time, I'm 12. Even though we're talking on the phone or whatever, or letters, but you're not seeing a person. You know, and you're trying to cram in everything that's been happening over these three or four year periods. Um, so it's a lot on, on, on any family, but particularly poor families. And when those vi we know the data speaks to visiting being one of the most essential things in keeping families connected. So uh, when that's um, hard to do, and, 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 and not to mention, right, I think this is important as well, the staff in, in these facilities, they aren't like pro-family, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not supportive of, you know, you know uh, too many hugs or too many, you know, too, it, all of that stuff is problematic. Um, so it, it really, um, you know, hurts keeping those family, you may, they, they may have a family room, but if it was an incident that happened there, now the family room, you can see it, but you can't go in it, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And my dad was in, started off in the USP, uh, United States Penitentiary, so that's a maximum security um, facility. So also visiting there was a bit different than it was when he got to FCI. You know, the tables are a little higher, you gotta sit a little further apart, like all of that stuff, um, you know, uh, has negative impacts on the visiting experience, particularly for, for, for a child. Yeah, probably a really upsetting environment to be in as a child. Yeah, for sure. Um, Amy, can I, can I turn it to you? And I'll come back to you, Tony. Um, Amy, I wanna ask you some questions that are specific to women in the criminal justice system. You went to prison when you were 31 years old. That's an age when many women are building a career or starting a family or both. What did it mean to you? How did missing out on those years affect you when you returned home at the age of 40? Um, okay, just wanna make sure it's turned on. Uh, well, it's kind of a two-stage two story um, of two totally different perspectives um, because um, first of all, I married and fell in love with a man in 1984, got married in 1985, but very quickly realized that I was not in a healthy relationship. I uh, wasn't in a healthy environment, but I was very much in love with this person. So it was just not appropriate in my mind to bring a child into the world in the environment that I was in. And so fast forward, um, even though I could not, I, I, I could not divorce him because I didn't have the mental capacity, wisdom, or um, sad, but uh, I didn't want to open up to my parents, um, which are the very people that you need to turn to, um, I found a way to get away from them by just simply moving to Los Angeles. And, um, but I still cared for him. And he was arrested in Germany. I knew parts and bits of um, what he was involved in, but uh, was shielded from the big picture. And um, I stupidly ran to his aid and flew to Germany, and that kind of put me under a microscope with the feds. So it wasn't, it was two years later, I was arrested and whisked to Waco, Texas, um, a city I'd never been to. The case was out of Dallas. And so I was determined to go to trial I had limited information, but I just didn't feel like it was my place to, to cooperate and engage in some of the activities that an attorney explained um, I would probably be required to do. So I got the inevitable 24 and a half years. Um, was always told I was gonna get 20 to life, and I was always like, okay, bring it on. <laughs> but, um, probably have regrets, um, which we can address later, That because um, you really have to come to terms with the fact with acceptance of responsibility. Once I r arrived in prison, I was 30, I was 31 in Waco, I turned 31 in Waco, 32, and I got to Dublin, 
and I watched the other women suffer with the additional trauma of incarceration. Most of them were mothers. And I just remember thinking, thank God I don't have that additional burden because my cell, we called them rooms, they had wooden doors, not bars. Um, they placed a telephone right outside my room in an echo chamber because I was in the coveted wing room section after receiving seniority. And I would have to listen, it wasn't a booth, so I would have to listen to those phone calls. And um, I would have to just walk out of my room. I couldn't. Um, some women were pretending as if they were away on a job. Some women were pretending as if they were in college. Some had uh, raised money in Unicor and sent money home. And um, this one elderly woman, I'll never forget her insisting that you better take, it was her grandbaby, to Chuck E. Cheese and for his birthday because she also made apple pies. We had a microwave and she could make the best apple pie and, um, on the compound. <laughs> and we have funny ways of raising money when we're in <laughs> incarcerated. And um, so listening to those conversations, including one where she was trying to tell her little son that he was gonna be taken away from his grandmother because he was acting out in, in school and um, trying to explain to him that some people were gonna take him away. And I, I, I just felt so fortunate that I didn't have a child when I was going through that stage. I participated in Family Day, which is a very important um, one day of the year. I don't even know if they still do it. <clears throat> oh, they don't. Uh, and back in the day when um, I was in prison, conditions were a little better. They seemed to be deteriorating. We decorated the recreation field. They even let us have a petting zoo. It was really quite a big deal. Um, and um, it, participating and watching that day where the women got to spend with their children all day long was probably the biggest moment for the women in prison. And it was heartbreaking for me because I just remember just sitting there thinking that if only people could see this, if people could just witness this experience and the bond that was so important, you could see that children were, some of them were having a good time, some of them were young, some of them didn't even understand where they were. Uh, we had Disney characters all around the rec field to kind of disguise the razor wire or, or deflect from the razor wire. And um, then there were some children that I, um, one daughter who was a friend of mine, um, you, could just, you could just tell they were um, distant and um, hurting and possibly resentful. I don't think that a lot of children understood why their parents wouldn't come home. So the next day, you would get to spend, um, if the children were even able to come to Children's Day, because family, again, would have to bring them in the hotel and the expense and everything. And uh, there was many times I was in the visiting room. and. Um, I know everyone has heard a child scream for a cookie or ice cream or a toy that was taken away from them, but I cannot delete the sound of the primordial, primal scream of a child that was being ripped away from its mother and could not understand why the mother wasn't leaving with the child. and. Um, that's just something you just can't get out of your head because it's different. It's a different, it's a different kind of emotion of being ripped apart from your mother and there's a real connection between a mother and a child um, intentionally um, that is God-given. And so 
um, my own mother and father came and visited me in Waco, Texas. It was a surprise because I had told them not to. And I'll never forget being my name called out, and that was where the plexiglass was, and that was traumatic. But when I was in prison in Dublin, I, I really didn't want them to come visit. I just felt like it was going to be, I, I, I just felt like phone calls were safer. But my mother was stubborn and um, insisted on coming for Thanksgiving. And um, if you've ever spent a holiday in prison, vending food machine is <laughs> about the worst <laughs> Thing you can um, imagine and everything is gone unless you're first and um, um, it's nothing like a ham sandwich when you, you look at it and it's kind of got that rainbow sheen on it and you're sitting there saying oh happy Thanksgiving and it was nice to see them they brought my grandmother but at the time when we separated it was almost as if I was the mother and my mom was the child she collapsed and just started bawling. And it took the guards helping her to get up and leave. And um, she's no longer here anymore, but um, that's when I said, that's it. Um, we will just communicate over the phone. They still came one more time. But <laughs> and my mother was my rock, and they're both past now, but um, um, visitation that, is very difficult. Bit? You talk about um, you, your parents have passed on, and you know you you didn't have the opportunity to have children. Can you talk a little bit about how spending that time um, in prison has really affected the the rest of your life? Well, I can sum it up that I uh, felt lucky um, that I wasn't going through that in prison, as I just said, and now I'm 63. And I'm dealing with the sting and the um, almost envious of the friends of mine who've come home, like Kimba and Shay and so many people who have reunited with their children, Alice. And, um, and I see, you know, they're, they're back and they're whole again. Um, some of the children may be dealt with trauma, but I don't have any blood relatives. And... Um, I do have a wonderful boyfriend who has a son, and he keeps saying, we're your family, we're your family, and I'm like, well, he has a mother, and I have to. Um, all I can say is that it's, um, uh, it feels, uh, there's a deep emptiness inside of me that I didn't get to have a child, or, um, and um, anyway, um, it's just something that many of us have to live with that lost our childbearing years. And the one thing I would like to say is that um, they took away uh, judges' rights to um, entertain any kind of mitigating circumstances. And men and women are different. Men can come home, and if they want, they can um, have children. God uh, made it that way, and um, so, and I went into early menopause, um, but still, how can you find a man who wants to start over again? And um, so, I'm, I don't have that opportunity, and thank you for thank asking. Thank you so much for sharing that really personal story, Amy. Uh, Rob, I want to turn it to you for a moment. Tony spoke about growing up with an incarcerated father. You were on the other side of that. You were 28 years old when you were sentenced to serve 61 years in prison. You and your wife had six young sons at that time. How did you manage to stay connected and involved in your son's lives uh, while you were incarcerated? Um, first of all, uh, one, I wanted to um, thank the DOJ uh, as well as the um, U.S. Pardons Office um, and you, uh, Elizabeth, for uh, putting together this panel. Um, thank the audience themselves for actually being here. Equally, if not more important, uh, thank for the panelists uh, who are here, uh, because this is a learning opportunity for many of us here in the audience, uh, but for those of us up here on the stage. 
it is a uh, revisit uh, to the traumas that we're still dealing with decades later. Uh, the one thing I heard when everybody grabbed the mic is that I heard a deep sigh. And a deep sigh is the fact that you have to take a deep plunge decades back down um, what your life has been in an effort to give to the audience an answer to the questions that, uh, that you're giving. So when I think about that, uh, one, I wanted to say thank you all for sharing. Um, but in my sharing, uh, as you may have mentioned, uh, my wife and I did have uh, six sons uh, going into this situation. And probably a defining moment with, uh, for me was when I um, read a Father's Day edition of, the, uh, of Men's Health magazine. And it talked about the amount of hours that the average father fit, uh, spends engaged with his children. And I realized that the uh, number of hours is uh, eight hours a month is the amount of time that the average father, not the incarcerated father, but the average father uh, spends engaged with their children. So I started realizing, doing the math real quickly, realizing that between two visits and if they got there early enough and stayed late enough, that I had about 16 hours a month that I could be uh, engaged with my children. I just had to be intentional about what I was going to do in that regard. So it made me have to think out of the box, uh, because as Tony has already made mention, you don't have the luxury of time on your side, meaning that you don't wake up in the morning and get to go in the other room and turn the light on and uh, see how they, um, how they slept last night, or um, you don't get an opportunity to pick them up at school and see how it was that the, uh, that the day went in school. Um, just a whole lot of those things. Uh, you're not afforded that because you don't have the time. So uh, with that being said, like I said, it just made me have to think outside of the box. And then for me, fathering for me became um, more like uh, coaching because uh, I've witnessed throughout all of my life, I watch coaches from the side of the ring, from the side of the basketball court, from the side of the football field, um, coach champions, you know, people to great success. And so I realized at that point that if I was gonna be a good father from prison, I had to become a good coach. So I knew that my job was gonna be taking place from the sideline, opposed to actually being in the house. And I think all too often that those are things that uh, policy makers, that uh, judges and district attorneys and people that are uh, in positions of power to make determinations about our lives for our transgressions don't necessarily take into consideration, is they don't take into consideration that we're people first with people with real emotions, uh, with people with uh, real problems, real issues, real emotions, and all of those things. And that we, uh, in these types of situations, uh, give birth or give life to children that are also real people, that are deserving of time to be spent uh, with their children, with their mothers, and mothers and fathers also uh, with, their, uh, with their children. Uh, because it's important in the uh, developmental process and to have a father and or a mother um, uh, exed out of or removed from the life of a child uh, increases the likelihood that that child um, will not succeed in life. Uh, having a child, that, um, a child that has a parent that's incarcerated, they're nine times more likely to wind up incarcerated themselves. Uh, seven times more likely to drop out of high school. The statistics go on and on and on in terms of uh, the negative effects that happen uh, as a result of having uh, a parent in incarcerated. So as a parent, a caring parent, no doubt, um, you have a, uh, a deep responsibility. Your parenting does not stop uh, the moment that your conviction happened. It does not stop uh, the moment that the gates close behind you. Uh, it does not stop the moment that you are uh, admitted uh, to the care of the Department of Corrections or to that of the, uh, of the federal government. Uh, your role as parent continues throughout. And again, like I said, you just have to find creative ways to do it. Uh, thank God for, um, for my wife and my family uh, who saw um, that we were in fact people first and that, um, that we deserved an opportunity, every available opportunity to spend time with each other and to spend time with our children. So uh, I think that my success uh, in rearing um, healthy and successful children had a lot to do with the fact that I had uh, family support.
So, Rob, I know you faced a lot of challenges while you were in prison trying to parent from, from in there. I, you continued to face challenges when you were released from prison. You ended up serving 21 years before the governor of Louisiana commuted your sentence in 2018. When you were released, you were nearly 50 years old. By that age, a lot of your peers had achieved things that you hadn't had the opportunity to achieve. Some of them uh, may own homes, they have careers that they've built, they have a 401k, they're saving for retirement. What was it like for you and what challenges did you feel or what stresses did you feel coming back out and not having had the opportunity to, to build any of those things? Mm -hmm. Well, September the 20th, 2018, as you mentioned, I walked out of Angola State Penitentiary. Uh, when I walked out of Angola State Penitentiary, I was 21 years and four days on the other side of my offense. And that is, in my mind, the way that I thought that I was going to enter uh, into the quote unquote free world. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, Sheena has already, already made mention, uh, almost immediately, uh, it was as if the, the, uh, the crime was committed the day that I was released. Um, my family um, made no mistakes about trying to um, um, remind me uh, to not go back to prison. Um, there were a host of different things that they could have said in greeting me, but one of the things that uh, they said in greeting me uh, was don't go back, as if though all of my life had been nothing but incarceration, uh, that all of my life had been spent going in and out of prison. I was a first offender. Uh, I had spent 21 years and four days of my life trying to get my life back. So. Uh, saying to me, um, don't go back, was probably the most offensive thing that you could have said to me in that moment. Um, after being uh, released, you have 72 hours before you report to a parole officer. Uh, my parole officer made no, uh, no qualms about reminding me that I was still under the custody and the supervision of the uh, Department of Corrections, that I still had a DOC number, and that I had a subordinate uh, position in, uh, in life, and that was is that I was an inmate. Um, that I was uh, an ex-con, that I was a felon. Um, when I filled out applications, as uh, Sheena again made mention, when it came to jobs, when it came to uh, higher education, when it came to uh, housing, all of these things, uh, there's a box for you to check as a formerly incarcerated person. With that being said, you, uh, you understand that all of the things that are most important to uh, a successful life as well as a successful reentry, that there are roadblocks that are created for you. But by and large, I think the biggest thing that I had as a challenge overcoming um, was the fact that I had a past. And my past, I'm still struggling to overcome what my past is. Um, I'm bigger than a felon. I'm more than an ex-con. Uh, I'm more than an inmate. Um, I'm more than all those things. Um, before I was ever those things, I was a father. Before I was ever those things, I was a son. Before that, I was a brother. Um, I was a community member. Uh, I served my country honorably. Uh, I was educated in an HBCU. Uh, I had a whole lot of things that describe me, um, that supersede. Um, these few negative things that people continue to use in an effort uh, to keep you in your place. Uh, so with that being said, um, my advocacy work began with uh, organizations like Participatory Defense, where we teach legal awareness as the best form of defense to people that are just as involved in my uh, work also. Uh, picked up with um, people's uh, People First initiative. Uh, that is um, in our efforts to try to uh, reshape and um, uh, rebrand uh, how it is that we think about people that are incarcerated. Thank you, Rob, and, and thank you to Amy and Tony and Sheena as well for sharing really personal experiences with all of us. You're all very brave to get up here on this stage with me and, and share, but I, I think we really can learn a lot by hearing stories like yours. Thank you. Um, Ames, I want to turn it to you. You and your colleagues at the Brennan Center have studied collateral consequences of criminal convictions extensively, and your research shows that experiences like the ones of Rob and Amy and Tony and Sheena are not unusual. I want to start by asking you, can you, can you just put this in context for us? How prevalent is the issue of having a criminal conviction? How many Americans are affected by this? 
happy to help speak, speak to that issue. And first of all, I want to thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Thank uh, everyone, as you said, for attending this conversation. And um, thank you all for the honor of sharing the stage with you all, um, people who are doing so much to make our justice system and our country better. It's a, it's a real honor to be here with you all. So I, I think one thing I want to leave everyone here with today is the scale of the problem and the scale of the work that has to be done to you know, build a better world, one where people have a real second chance and a chance to you know, transcend these collateral consequences. So we heard the Associate Attorney General at the top of the program say that there are um, 70 to 100 million criminal records in the United States, 70 to, 70 to 100 million people who have a criminal record in the United States. That's um, people who, you know, if you ran an inquiry in the FBI system, you'd get a ding back that they had an arrest record or something like that. But you know, that's really the tip of the iceberg because there are, there are many different kinds of criminal records and they all have a different effect on people's lives. Um, so you need to understand what, what it really looks like. So <clears throat> to give you some perspective on that, um, based on work my colleagues and I at the Brennan Center have done, um, there are more than 40 million people who have a misdemeanor conviction in the United States. That's more than one in 10 Americans have a misdemeanor conviction. And I, I, I think it's very tempting in our work to think of misdemeanors as, you know, quote, lower level offenses that, you know, the, the penalties are small, so, uh, that seem small, so surely they can't have that much an effect on life. That's actually very much not the case, as I think you've, you've probably heard today. Misdemeanors can have a life-altering effect on someone's um, uh, ability to earn a living wage and um, conduct a normal, uh, dignified life. So that, that's, that's more than 40 million people um, at the outset. Uh, there are around 20 million people who have a felony conviction of some sort on their record. Um, of those 20 million, around 7.7 .7 to 8 million people have spent time in a federal prison at some point in their lives. So that means they've spent more than one year uh, behind bars in a correctional facility. Um, and then, of course, we get to the number of people who are in prison today. It's around 2 million people total who are either incarcerated in jail or uh, imprisoned in a state or federal prison. Um, so this is a, a huge volume of Americans. And Ames, can you tell us how many children are affected by having an incarcerated parent? Yes, definitely. So um, the numbers actually vary depending on the, on the research you read, which I think is an interesting question of its own. But um, according to some estimates, around 2.7 million minor children today uh, have a caregiver who's in a correctional facility of some kind. Uh, if you expand outward to think of how many people uh, how many minor children have had a parent in a correctional facility it expands to around 5 million. Um, so uh, I, I think what we see is, is, is um, I think what so many of uh, my panelists have, or co-panelists have been getting at is, uh, uh, as it's been said, you know, no man is an island, no woman is an island. Uh, we see the effects on an individual, but uh, those spread out beyond, beyond them to families, to communities. So we've, we've heard from our panelists about different types of collateral consequences, housing, em employment, uh, parenting related, all sorts of things. I want to talk a little bit about the economic consequences. Can you talk about the different ways in which having a criminal record can affect employment opportunities? Yes, there are, there are many, uh, and the first is just in even getting a job. Um, some of the best work on the subject comes from the late Diva Pager. She was a famous sociologist at Harvard. She conducted a study uh, that showed that having a criminal record cut your chances of getting a callback interview in half. If you were white, if you were black, the cut was even deeper. So already we're seeing you know, another important aspect of this is that the economic consequences of a criminal record are, are severe, but are, they also resonate in racial justice as well. Um, so that, that's some really important work that sort of serves as a foundation for this. Um, my colleague, Dr. Terry Ann Craigie, uh, she's a professor at Smith College of Economics. Um, she and I wrote a paper together that sort of expanded on this idea. <clears throat> and what we found is that um, all other things being held equal to the best of our statistical ability, um, People who have spent time in prison earn about half as much annually uh, relative to people who are otherwise like them but have not spent time in prison. Um, over the course of a career, that can add up to half a million dollars. Um, that's a lot of money, <laughs> uh, especially for families who are you know, on the edge of poverty or struggling with poverty. That is absolutely the difference between poverty and stability and the difference between deep poverty, inescapable poverty, intergenerational poverty, and poverty you can get out of if you really, really work hard despite all the headwinds. Um, I think that's, that's an astonishing figure, but it actually, that, that wasn't the part of the study that took our breath away. What really surprised us is, is what I got to a little earlier is that even a misdemeanor conviction reduced annual earnings by around 
Um, that's for, for people who are you know, living paycheck to paycheck, and I think many Americans are. 15% um, isn't something you can afford to have you know, taken out of your pocket. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a loss that can compound. Um, and the way, that, uh, the way that this happens, I think, is number one, it's more difficult to get a job, like I was, I was saying earlier. Um, number two, it might be, might be more difficult to get a promotion. Um, there are a lot of jobs for which you might need a professional license to advance in your career. Um, you might not be able to get a license because uh, the exam might require a background check and it'll return your criminal record as a flag and your license will be denied, no questions asked, no opportunity to um, uh, inquire further. Uh, and then, of course, I think another really challenging part of it is um, time in prison is time out of the economy. I mean, as, as you all know, uh, it's time that you can't spend in your community developing connections, developing skills. And um, you know, the sad reality of, of prisons in this country is that we don't invest enough resources to um, help people develop skills, maintain skills, maintain connections for um, when they get out. Um, th those are just some of the ways. There are, there are a thousand other ways that um, having a criminal record can, can interact with your ability to earn a living wage and uh, lead a dignified life after. Thank you, Ames. So having a, a criminal conviction reduces your earnings. Uh, spending time in prison reduces your earnings even further. And these consequences disproportionately affect communities that are already impoverished, you, you've said. C can you talk about uh, the role that that plays in entrenching the wealth gap in our country and the role that that plays um, in entrenching systemic racial inequalities in our, in our society? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one of the things we found in our research is that um, when you look at the around 8 million people in the United States who have spent time in prison, um, the uh, composition of it does not look like the country as a whole. Uh, nationally, I think um, uh, black men and women make up around 13% of the country's population as a whole. Uh, they make up about 30% of the formerly incarcerated population as a whole. And that's the result of you know, years of laws that uh, disproportionately impacted people of color. Um, these figures actually can be worse state by state. And um, in New York, where the Brennan Center is based, um, the racial disparities are even starker. It's the result of the Rockefeller drug laws, I think, uh, which some of you might know were um, uh, laws that had a very strong and targeted disproportionate impact on people of color. Um, so that means that you know, when we're talking about um, uh, the economic effect of a criminal record, it's already concentrated in communities of color um, at the outset. But that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's not just that the effects are concentrated in communities of color. They're actually worse for people of color as well. So um, my colleague, Dr. Craigie, was able to pull out a sort of trend line allowing us to chart you know, the, an average person. And we're talking always about an average person. What happens to an average person's um, ability to earn a living wage after they leave prison over the course of their career? And for you know, white people with a prison record, we saw the, a, a, a dampened but positive earning trajectory you know, goes up. Um, for um, black and Latino people, people of color, the line was much closer to flat. So you don't see the sort of wage growth that people reasonably expect over the course of a career, and that frankly you need to afford the basics of life in this country, like, like owning a home, like supporting kids. Um, so I, I, I think this is, um, this is part of the problem uh, that helps explain the racial wealth gap in this country because, like I said earlier, the, the sheer amount of money we're talking about that uh, is missed out on over the course of a career can absolutely lead to disadvantage translated over the course of generations. But you know, one thing we found that was also really surprising, um, uh, but that aligns with what some other people have found as well, um, we found that uh, black men and women with no criminal record actually earned less than otherwise comparable white men and women with a criminal record. So it, it just goes to show that you know, we're talking about you know, the way the criminal justice system and mass incarceration affect communities of color disproportionately and help perpetuate the racial wealth gap. But that's just, that's just part of it. There are so many other parts of um, the way our country works currently that um, are also contributing factors. It's a, it's a deeply complex problem. Wow, and $500,000 in earnings, that might be you know, a home ownership for some Absolutely. people, a home that you could pass to the next generation that people lose out on. That's a paid off mortgage. Absolutely. Yes. Can I add something? 
Yes, Sheena, please. One thing that came to mind when you were speaking um, that we don't talk about often is that it is hard for people with uh, convictions to get insured. I have been flagged many times looking at applications for just even the simple things, and it will ask, have you ever been arrested or do you have a conviction? I mean, just the things that we want to do to like, enjoy life or leisure, for leisure time, even down to like Airbnbs who are now flagging and, uh, if you have a conviction and denying people to, to rent, uh, uh, if you're renting a car. Um, I have heard stories from um, people, uh, specifically this young lady who actually um, her case was dismissed, but because of the arrest, she was denied insurance for her and her family, her children, house insurance, because of the type of case it was. And so this is something that also can impact a family economically. Without even having a criminal conviction. Yes, and so mm -hmm. when we talk about uh, <laughs> records, we're not just talking about people with convictions, misdemeanors or felony convictions, we're talking about people who've just been arrested and the case has been dismissed, we're finding that they're dealing with barriers. They have to go down the rabbit hole just to, just to engage or get, they have barriers as well in front of them. So I, I think we've identified a lot, a lot of problems here and I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about some of the solutions. All of you are involved in advocacy for uh, solutions to some of these problems and I don't wanna leave our audience feeling um, as much despair and hopelessness as they may be feeling right now. So let's try to talk a little bit about, about some of the things that we can do together here in the Department of Justice and in partnership with all of these folks in our audience to to address some of these issues. Um, I want to start with you, Sheena. You, you took your own experience with the criminal legal system and turned it into advocacy, and you have become a prolific advocate around the country for automatic record clearing. Can you tell us a little bit about what record clearing is and how, how it works or would work in your ideal world? Yes, and I, I want to say, you know, I, I was um, able to do a TED Talk earlier this year in Vancouver, and I was sharing my story, and I remember telling them, I didn't travel all the way to Vancouver to share bad news. We got good news, too. And so I would say that the same with our, 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 my, my peers on the panel, that we do have good news to deliver. Folks are doing the work in the fields. Um, and like I like to say, taking my pain to purpose, and I believe all of us have you taken our pain points and finding our purpose and to shift policy. And that policy for me is record clearance. And so the Clean Slate Initiative is the organization that I lead. We are an organization that is a bipartisan organization that is focused on record clearance across the country, removing the barriers um, that are set forth for, in front of people who are eligible to even get their record cleared. The law says that they have remained crime-free and um, uh, they have waited the, the time periods and they should be able to get their record cleared. But the issue is systematically, systemically, uh, there are still barriers there. It was created that way that folks got to wait oh, five to 10 years. They have to pay fees. They have to get a lawyer. And so the record clearance policy that we're pushing um, across the country is automating that process. When a person is eligible, when their time has come up, that their record is automatically clear. Think about your credit. I know some of us, I know me, have waited the seven years for something to jump off, like that, waiting for that time clock. And I don't have to do anything. I don't have to write a I see people nodding their heads. You don't got to write a letter. You don't got to call and remind them, like, my day is here. But that, that record will automatically clear. And so we have seen momentum across the country. And also we see lawmakers uh, who know that this is even uh, physically sound for their, their, their state and the government to automate the process. So the laws on record clearing vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Could you give us just a brief overview of kind of the lay of the land on where record clearing is available? Yes, yeah, so just about all 50 states have a mechanism to get your record clear. And just let me just back up a little bit. But for folks who don't know the process, you have to petition to get your record cleared. That means if I just walk you through, uh, you have to go to whether your courts, your clerk, and you have to petition after waiting a certain amount of time and no one's keeping track of the clock when you're trying to deal with life, right? Or when you're eligible, you have to file that petition. You have to wait till they respond. You have to get a lawyer. You may have to go through all these steps and pay fees. I know like in Louisiana, you have to pay up to $500 per offense just to get your record cleared. Um, in Missouri, uh, you could be eligible to get your record cleared, but it's up to a judge discretion if they think that you're rehabilitated, if not, 
in, if, if they want to give you your rec get your record cleared. But again, the good news: there are 12 states who have in uh, passed legislation, uh, clean slate policy. Uh, where automation is available. Um, some states are in different stages where they're automating it. Um, Michigan um, most recently passed a law. I was able to go to Michigan on April 1st where it went into effect. And on day one, they was able to clear a million records for people. And I was, uh, yeah. Um, we have passed it in states like Utah, um, Oklahoma, Delaware, um, Connecticut, New York most recently passed, waiting for the governor to sign that into law. Uh, but I just want to just go back to like Michigan. I was able to visit Michigan the day it went into implementation, and I met a young lady named Elvina, and she was saying that she's been waiting for this moment for 18 years. She had got um, convicted 18 years prior. Um, for something small, I would say, some, uh, some financial, uh, uh, it was like a fraud case or whatsoever. And she said, I never got in trouble in my life. It was something I was so regretful, I was shameful, I was scared. She goes, I, had, I was forced to go to alcohol uh, counseling, and she's like, I never even, I don't even drink, I don't do drugs, and I was stigmatized, and I couldn't even go volunteer in my children's lunchroom. And she goes, finally, I have a chance at, you know, being able to get a job. And I just want to report that day, she was so excited for finally getting her record cleared, and she emailed me about two weeks later, it's like, they can't find me in the system, I really have a, my records cleared. She goes, but I'm still struggling to find a job, and I love to report that most recently she got uh, a, a job at a state college, and she's now living her best life. She's like, now I have to tell people I'm not available. I got jobs coming at me back and forth. So we're seeing success in the field, and it's probably a lot of more stories that don't get to me, but there's success with this policy passing. And record clearance is really, um, it's happening on the state level, but we don't have that process on the federal level. And I'm hoping that the momentum that is being seen across the country will show folks at the federal level that we need to hear too. Thank you, Sheena. So, Tony, here in D.C., we don't have automatic record clearing yet, but we do have clemency. Anyone with a conviction under D.C. law is eligible to apply for a presidential pardon. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how returning citizens can benefit from a pardon? Um, I think, you know, all has been shared about what the barriers are of having uh, criminal history. Um, so the ability to be pardoned would open up so many doors for returning citizens around, um, you know, employment, <laughs> training, housing, um, all of the above, people's ability to really get back to zero, as I like to say, um, and just be seen as citizens, to have their full rights restored. Um, what becomes problematic, um, and I know particularly here in D.C., is most people have a crime that, be, that could be considered violent, right? And I think, it's particularly coming out of the Obama administration or that era, um, the term uh, low-level drug offender um, sort of became uh, the person or the people that the broader society saw as being worthy of redemption. Um, well, most people that I'm dealing with in my the past 23 years of my life in terms of what I do for a living, helping men and women return from incarceration, most people aren't a nonviolent drug offender. They may have a nonviolent drug offense, but they have other offenses. And I personally um, hope that we can push for um, all crimes to be uh, an option at a part in uh, uh, a commutation, clemency, because uh, people need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, an individualized approach, um, and based on their um, rehabilitative um, history, their contributions, their growth, their uh, healing, that people can have that option, because without that, I don't think we will ever really move the needle where we need to move it. And I think it's unfair for you know, I think about my work as an advocate in this city um, and all of the lives that I've touched and all the people that I've met and the people that I stand um, shoulder to shoulder with every day, particularly those that are returning citizens, most of them have a violent crime. 
They have been some of the greatest pillars in this city. And so for them, I think about them when I make statements like this, right? If I, th if I think about any returning citizen that should be worthy of a pardon, uh, it would be those men and women that I hold hands with every day to help keep this community safe, to help change lives. And so I think we really have to um, uh, reframe who we see as being worthy of redemption and really foster a broader um, culture of redemption once people pay their debt. And if we believe in our justice system, if we believe in our judges, um, they, they hand down a sentence, people do that sentence, you know, we can't keep holding people, you know, to that. They, they paid their debt, and we need, I think it's in all of our interests, particularly from a public safety lens, to allow people to assimilate and be back into the fold so that they can be um, the models in their families um, and in their communities for the people coming behind them. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's my, you know, sort of my, I think, unique perspective, or I, I have a... I'm, position in the way that I, I see that and I work in this in that way where it's like, man, and people here don't understand, I think that you can petition to the president for a pardon honestly, and we gotta build awareness around that but at the same time, I think a lot of people are gonna be reluctant to even you know, go at it. Um, I am proud to say that in the last like six months we've been having conversations with some members of our council about um, proposing legislation around record sealing right now. I think there's only one felony that can potentially be sealed in the District of Columbia and every, anything violence, you know, homicides, attempted murder, assault with a deadly weapon, uh, armed robbery, carjacking, all that stuff is definitely off the table. Um, and um, I, I hope to work with others to change that. Tony, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad you, you raised a, a lot of good points, but we do hear a lot about nonviolent drug offenders and nonviolent drug offenders being deserving of relief, but everybody is capable of redemption. Amy, I want to turn it to you uh, to ask you about the importance of clemency. You've received clemency twice, a commutation and a pardon. Um, receiving clemency doesn't clear your record in the way that, that Sheena described, uh, but it does help to ease some of the burdens of having a criminal conviction. Can, can you talk about your experience? What did it mean to you to receive clemency from the president? Hello? Uh, <laughs> And I didn't thank you originally, but I want to thank the audience and thank you so much. It's an honor to be on this panel and to be able to share. Everyone has amazing stories, so I feel honored to have this opportunity. Um, it's a badge of honor, and my mother, um, I grew up in a very small town of 2,000 people in Charleston, Arkansas, and she was the organist at church. She was the choir leader. She sang at every wedding. She was the editor of the newspaper, which she was the only employee <laughs> that did the <laughs> newspaper and worked so hard to be a pillar in the community. And uh, she put a gag order on me, and the only person that I had told was my college roommate, and she put a gag, gag order on her, Kim, who kept her promise, and that nobody could know in the little community about me going to prison. So she would just say that I lived in California, which I did, and... <clears throat> um, so when Glamour Magazine um, focused on my story, <clears throat> my mother actually did not think anyone in Charleston would read Glamour Magazine. <laughs> Go figure, and uh, phones lit up everywhere. And it was one of the <clears throat> better things that happened to me because um, when Clinton became president, um, people from my little hometown one person I went to high school with was Hillary's Taylor, and um, somebody else who was head of a college was invited to the White House. Senator Bumpers is from my little bitty hometown who knew President Clinton, and then everybody um, wanted to, to help. Everybody was 
um, more than willing and sympathetic. Um, and all the churches signed um, petitions and uh, was a big reason why I came home. But um, in, in my work uh, with the Can Do Foundation, um, even though with that, that badge of honor, my mother died 10 days before I received the full pardon. And um, I can honestly say, uh, if I could trade my full pardon for bringing somebody home, I would, um, because it, uh, it didn't really change my life. However, in my work at the Can Do Foundation, I, I communicate with people in prison, but I stay in touch with people who've come home, and I can't tell you the number of phone calls I've received of somebody who was actually in tears because they had just lost the opportunity for their dream job with benefits. And um, I know someone, several people personally, but one person comes to mind who's been out for quite a long time. She can't, um, she can't invest in even a condo or any kind of a home environment and the rent eats up, uh, she lives in Chicago, eats up a lot of her money. She works two, two jobs, two and a half jobs, and she just can't um, invest, even though there still is no victim. Sometimes you pay the victim off, but um, many of these restitution orders are, are millions of dollars. So, um, and I also have a, a very dear friend who grew up from the time she was two years old here in the United States. Her only crime is a, uh, a marijuana charge. And although we can't do pardons for people who are deported, she has to live just across the border and all of her family is here in the U.S. and her parents are getting elderly and I, 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 I wish with all my heart that that could be opened up to, to people because she's suffering. Um, but I, I communicate so often with people who, um, uh, another woman who got to have lunch with President Obama along with, with Kimba and Norman, who's here. She, um, I won't mention names because I'm not supposed to mention names, but um, she's applying and she wants to get into home care. And she's taking care of her elderly parents and she's so good at it and she's blocked from getting into home care. So um, a pardon, a full pardon means so much to so many and um, would open up doors that are closed to people. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, Rob, I'm, I'm going to turn it to you. You also received clemency, and you described that experience as bittersweet because you left a lot of people behind, and I know that that has motivated you to advocacy. Can you talk a little bit about that feeling that I, I've heard you describe as survivor's guilt mm -hmm. after receiving clemency? Yeah, I think um, anybody that has been in any type of war, uh, tattered type situation or whatever, whether you've been off to Vietnam or whether you've been uh, housed inside of a prison for the last 20 years, you develop uh, some, um, some really deep bonds with the people that you do time with. Um, and as a result of it, uh, when your tour of duty or when your day uh, or your time is up, you exit outside of the prison and that you're hopeful that many of the people that you've spent time building uh, bonds with, that they're afforded a similar opportunity. So it does have a, uh, a way of making you feel uh, a degree of guilt because you want them to go with you. You want them to uh, not only be excited about the fact that you're going home, but also that they too have the opportunity to do, uh, to do the same. Um, so I knew that um, after leaving prison, probably one of the greatest takeaways that I had was that uh, to be free is to free others. And with that knowing, um, I guess it would uh, say it was at that point that it began my post-prison uh, work as it relates to our advocacy. Uh, I started doing that with, um, with the um, National Organization of Participatory Defense. Uh, we judge the uh, success of our work by the amount of time that we save people, uh, opposed to the amount of time that they've been sanctioned to do inside a prison. Uh, as a national organization, we've saved well over 10,000 years of people doing time. Uh, in Louisiana, where we run the, uh, the New Orleans hub, uh, we've saved more than 3,000 years of people doing time uh, as a result of um, post-prison uh, advocacy as well as um, through policy changes and so forth. 
Um, but like you said, with those things uh, said, that I knew that if I was going to be successful in helping other people uh, reap the same benefit that I had, I knew that I was going to have to change my survivor's guilt into a uh, survivor's ambition. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, like I said, I started working uh, closely uh, with organizations like Participatory Defense, uh, working with organizations like uh, People First, um, through um, the sharing of our story, uh, through the Oscar-nominated documentary time uh, that's airing uh, live on Amazon Prime Video, if y'all hadn't had an opportunity <laughs> to see it yet. <laughs> Right, you know, and if you uh, if you like books, then there is a uh, literary companion, also named Time, uh, that gives a deeper dive into uh, what our family's experiences have been like. And if you're a type of person that is looking for something that's new that everybody else has not had an opportunity, that everyone else has not had an opportunity to see as of yet, we do have time to the sequel that is coming, and we are submitting to uh, Sundance uh, in four days. Uh, so we're really excited about that. But um, through uh, documentaries, we're able to uh, shape the narrative. Uh, we're able to uh, show ourselves in ways that uh, move beyond uh, seeing ourselves as, uh, as uh, offenders. We're able to move and um, you know, allow people to see us beyond uh, the crimes that we've committed, uh, but to see deeper into uh, who we are, and that is, uh, like I said, we're people first. Rob, thank you, and I agree with you. Storytelling is so important, and I just want to reiterate that I'm so grateful to the four of you who've shared your very personal stories here today. Um, Ames, I, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, some of the solutions that you have been studying and, and working on with respect to some of these collateral consequences. Could you talk about what, what solutions you and your colleagues at the Brennan Center uh, propose to some of these issues, and could you focus uh, specifically on what role clemency can play in, a, in addressing some of these issues? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with just a quick note on, on Clean Slate and Sheena's amazing work. Um, uh, I think collateral consequences, it's important to understand and that we all understand, are, are downstream of criminal records. And, and as Sheena pointed out, uh, criminal records in this country are, are public and permanent by default. And that's not the way a lot of things in this country work. You can go bankrupt and 10 years later, it's gone from your credit report, like, like you said. Um, in other Western democracies, uh, there's a right to rehabilitation uh, and collateral consequences are deliberately you know, sunset. They fade after three years. Just a long way of saying, like, it doesn't have to be this way. Like, we can have a different system. There are other countries that have done this. There are other ways of thinking that can achieve this. So I, uh, I'm a big fan of, of Clean Slate, and, uh, and uh, I think it's something that is, is definitely worth exploring. Um, I'll say there's definitely a role for the Justice Department to play. Um, getting these uh, le getting this piece of legislation stood up are, are challenging. Like there's a, there's a bunch of databases that have to talk to each other. It's incredibly complicated, but there's a role of support that you know, DOJ and the federal government can play in um, getting everyone together, convening, giving advice, technical assistance to help, uh, help land the plane there. Um, but as you said, to go back to your, your question directly, clemency is, is hugely important here. You know, it can't wipe away all the collateral consequences. It's not the same as, uh, as having your record sealed. But um, going into a job application, it's an assertion that, you know, the President of the United States sat behind the Resolute desk and saw fit to give me this grant of mercy. That's huge. That's a great deal. Um, <clears throat> and something I think that's, that's really important here, too, is, is as, as you and your office know very well, you know, President Biden and the Biden administration have put some real thought into uh, an innovation, into you know, sort of rethinking what clemency can be. You know, last year, the president uh, granted a, a pardon to uh, people convicted of simple marijuana possession offenses. Um, that is interesting on its own terms, but if you look sort of below the surface about uh, to how that grant works, it's really interesting and points away toward you know something bigger. So, the way that pardon works is uh, it, the president reached out to DOJ and said, this is something we're going to work together on. I want you to help develop the tools to identify these people to grant this um, pardon to. Uh, that's a formula, that's a tool that I think can be applied in other cases as well. You know, the president can say, there are these other cases, I think, of broad categories of people who are deserving of mercy. Justice Department, can we work together? Can we talk about this and figure out a way to identify those people, get them to my desk, and I'll sign the pardon? You know, there are, there are many cases that my colleagues and I at the Brennan Center have worked on where changes in federal sentencing law to make uh, some, of, some of the penalties that we've discussed here you know, less cruel, uh, frankly, less uh, disproportionate. Um, laws have tempered those sentences, made them lesser over time. 
But those changes often apply only to cases going forward. They don't always apply to people who are already in prison serving those sentences that Congress has just abrogated. I think that's, that's just staggering. And that's a case where I think there's a really clear case for um, where clemency might play a role. Um, I should say, too, that I think uh, executive leadership here matters far beyond the federal government uh, and matters far, um, far beyond the confines of this room. You know, with uh, President Biden's um, marijuana pardon that I discussed, we saw state governors start to pick up their pens, too, and start to grant cl clemency to uh, marijuana cases in their jurisdiction. You know, the president can't pardon federal crimes, but the president can set a standard that other leaders can aspire to. And I think that that leadership is just hugely important. Um, it can really change the way we think about collateral consequences, the way we think about second chances. And um, that's why I'm just so thrilled to be part of this conversation today. That's, that's how we started. Thank you so much, James, and thank you to all of our panelists. It has been an honor to host this conversation. Please, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. I am almost done, I promise. I'm almost done. I know we're, ca we're catching up on lunchtime. I, I just want to say again, I am so grateful to all of you, our panelists, for sharing your really personal experiences and your insight and your wisdom with us. I also want to thank our audience members for taking the time to be here today to listen to this really important conversation. And I want to give huge thanks to my colleagues at the Office of the Pardon Attorney who made this event possible. It is so important to have conversations like this in the Department of Justice. We cannot fulfill our mission without understanding the experiences of people who are directly impacted by the criminal legal system. Those voices need to be heard in this building, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. Thank you.